What is going on? It's Alex coming back at you with another video. And today we're going to be breaking down the top quarterbacks in the 2025 NFL draft class. If you are new, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Go to that link tree because you are also two clicks away from going to anywhere, including especially my X page where I end up posting a lot of all 22 clips that justify exactly what we're going to be talking about in this video. In this video, we're going to be going over 14 quarterbacks, technically 16, but you know, one of them is not evaluated. One of them I am classifying for a pure return because we'll discuss it in a second. But, um, you know, I do want to be able to emphasize that each one of these players is going to be having its own scouting report from a specific game being read to you. It's notes I write for myself, but you guys love it. I'm going to walk you through it. And let's just have a good time starting out with understanding how I grade the position. So there is a scale of one to 100, but I also want to emphasize that different points are different thresholds for different roles. So there is that tier one of the guys who I think right away, regardless of system, can come in and play QB1. I'm going to spoil it for you guys. There are none in this class. Just for me, I think a lot of them are either going to be backup quality or in the right system, a quarterback one. And that's the thing. If you're in the right system, that easily can push you up a tier, if not two, because there's certain systems like the 49ers that have sometimes been more friendly. Kevin O'Connell has been very friendly to the quarterbacks that could end up propelling your role. So keep that in mind as well. But this is solely outside of system. Of course, then you, yes, talked about that Q quarterback two territory, which I call a fringe quarterback. I also talk about a lot of different positions in that regard as well. Then we have the tier three, which are the guys that you should be sitting for a minimum of a year, a minimum of two years. But have a potential chance to be able to grow, develop an extra tier, and then the right system could be a QB1, or really just have that great work mentality, work ethic, and they can get up to that QB1 territory. So it's not all lost if you are in a lower tier, but again, I do want to emphasize the fact that, well, it just makes it a lot harder. There's only 32 quarterbacks in the entire country that can actually start. It's not going to have like 32 of them, or if even in this case, 14 of them that come out of this class. But on top of that, don't take dream fits too seriously. I do have an it factor that adjusts based on my scale that ends up allowing for injury, for height, for things that don't get categorized like what we talk about here. And this video is going to be the actual grading scale got shifted specifically for this video because I'm implementing something a little bit unique that I'll explain in a second. But arm strength is basically the consistency of the velocity of the ball. Now, I don't have next gen stats. So I'm using more of an eye test. This is something that could definitely vary over time. But, you know, there's after enough games, you kind of get a good feel for how strong a guy's arm is processing. That's like your genuine decision making. It's sometimes do you go from one read to another? Like there's certain systems that require progressions more than others. And over time, I've had to be able to filter that in. And that's just something that you get with time. And that's OK. This is one of those positions that I personally have been continuing to try to develop my own understanding of because it's a position I love to study and it's a position that I know that I can continue to improve upon. But processing is just basically do you make the right decision? Do you force reads? If you do, probably not making the right decision, right? Then we're talking about accuracy because guys, for some reason, can be pinpoint accurate at the middle range. And guys like Miller Moss, who we'll talk about in a second, uh, cannot hit guys short right. but they can hit guys pretty much anywhere else on the field. And then there's guys like Quinn Ewers who we'll be talking about that can't hit a guy deep in stride to save their life. So I do want to be able to emphasize the difference between accuracy of short, medium, and long distance. And then placement as well. Like first off, is it catchable? I think that's the most important factor. But now in the NFL, Field Yates has highlighted this as well. It's no longer can the guy catch it. Is is it in stride? Is it in the right window? Because defensive backs have gotten better and better and Unfortunately, the windows are smaller and smaller, so it makes it much more difficult for quarterbacks that cannot be precise to be able to succeed the NFL level. Uh, mobility, self-explanatory. I think that you need to have some form base of mobility to be able to at least evade pass rushers and extend plays. Speaking of, this is the big change, playmaking. I used to have this as a relatively subjective category where um, I ended up just basically saying, okay, well, how do they handle pressure and can they extend plays and make big plays? And I think that definitely has its own use, but I ended up wanting to get a little bit more nitty gritty on this. I ended up being able to create essentially four categories that combine into one kind of crazy, but this is actually based on solely numerics rather than a subjective grade, which is four subjective grades into one numeric. But I look at both their quality and consistency of both arm throws, like throwing big plays, 
and running big plays because I want to still give credit to the guys who, like Jalen Milrow, have that running capability. But I think that's far more emphasized in the NFL for you to use your arm to make big plays than your legs. So I weight it at about two thirds to one third um, comparatively, and it creates and combines into making its own playmaking score. So it finally, I kind of took that out of my own hands, which I didn't, but at the same time I did. Uh, timing, I ended up removing mechanics because mechanics are just so, like at this point, the NFL learns to work with different guys for different mechanics. If I think the mechanics are bad, I'm putting it in the it factor. Okay, that's just the thing. We'll talk about it as time goes on. But speaking of time, timing is super key. Do you throw to guys at the right time? If you don't, you are screwed. Like you just wait too long. Well, unless you have a Drew Aller arm, you're probably not getting it there in the NFL. So timing is super key. And not only is throw timing key, also leaving the pocket. So that combines timing as well as pocket awareness. So basically, do you know if there are guys coming from behind you? Do you know when the, you know, what's going to be developing in the pocket? All of that makes my grading so long way uh, to be able to explain exactly what I'm thinking here but I think it's super crucial you guys can end up skipping it because you know if you guys didn't want to listen to this you guys already have skipped it but I know a lot of you guys really care about how I end up grading players and I think you guys deserve it so Kyron Jones is someone who I really want to evaluate as you guys know I don't work for a massive organization I've been actually working with them to be able to do that in 2025 spoiler alert um, so we'll see if that ends up becoming a thing, but they have some access to something called true media, which is a version of PFF ultimate. Once we are able to do that, we'll have access to a lot more all 22 film at this moment, because I'm keeping this here so that I can end up putting Kyron drones back into the mix. When we end up getting more all 22 tape, um, there is no Virginia tech, all 22 offensive tape. I wish there were, but I'm not going to grade a player on base game tape. I need to watch it through coaching tape. It keeps it equal. It allows me to understand exactly what they're doing. And it's not fair to you guys for me to just watch like a little thing that the same thing that you guys get to watch and then end up bullshitting about the fact that I knew that he made the right read. Like, unfortunately, unless you watch the whole field, you can't say that confidently. And I owe it to you guys to be a little bit more integral rather than just pumping out a ton of dudes. I could have ended up saying, oh, these are the 25 guys and then completely bullshitted you. Not going to do that. Um, I prefer to give you guys a little bit of a shorter list. But Kyron Drones is um, someone who I'm very excited to study when the time comes. And then I have to toss in Miller Moss here as well. He was supposed to be included in this video, but today he ended up being benched. So I highly doubt that he's going to be coming out in this class. I'm going to be reserving him for next year's work. So keep that in mind as well. It sucks, but honestly, um, I actually talked to a source very close to him where we might be getting him on the show. So we'll be talking about potentially his future in a couple of weeks, if not maybe a couple months. Let's get in on this. Starting out with our quarterback 14. This is going to piss people off. Out the gate, Jackson Dart. And again, you guys know I had 25 quarterbacks to start out this year. Being at 14, it's pretty fine. I'm just going to put that there. He did end up improving overall. Even if his grade technically dropped, he actually did improve. It's just, again, I took out mechanics as a gimme category. All these guys dropped. Just keep that in mind. So we're going to read his notes from the South Carolina game. And then, of course, we'll go back and look at it overall. So he instantly, right off the bat, forces a specific in route. He forced another deep ball. It did not have bad placement, though. So I do really appreciate that about him. Um, those deep balls, even if it takes a while to get there, similar to Dylan Gabriel, the rainbow actually does work. Uh, he had a good thread over the middle of the field. He did force a slant. There were a ton of manufactured throws and reads, which similar to Lane Kiffin's offense as well as Cliff Kingsbury's there. Well, I guess Cliff Kingsbury, but I was actually thinking of, um, why am I tripping USC's head coach Riley, whatever the fuck his name is, but, um, there's a lot of manufactured reads in those offense, not a lot of decision-making from the quarterback in that whole mix regardless um he ended up having an underthrown go ball again it's kind of due to his arm strength not necessarily being that crazy uh he, he said his eyes go down upon initial pressure so rather than keeping his eyes up and essentially shifting through the pocket i saw him drop his eyes to essentially evade the contact the best quarterbacks that you see in the nfl look at the joe burrows of the world they don't have to be uber athletic they don't have to be uber mobile or even uber slippery but their attention is down the field the whole time because they're sub-processing how to get around the defender. I did not see that with Jackson Dart. It almost was as if most of the focus, if not all of it, was focused on let's evade the defender and then get our eyes back downfield to throw. That's not really great. I said a horribly thrown ball or a whole horribly slow ball that he lofted. Um, it should have been an interception, ended up not being. He ended up throwing an in route that was um, 
first off force, but also behind the receiver. And it was just bottom line. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> if you, if you're, you're forcing an in route. So a defender's on your hip and then you throw it behind the defenders on your ass. It should be a pick. So uh, it should have been another INT in my opinion. I said it takes way too long for him to see wide open receivers. That is true. Honestly, the timing just was not there. He ended up having his uh, his pass die on a 50 plus yard throw. So uh, like sometimes distance is key, but distance isn't always there, right? Like you sometimes have balls that will, you know, for certain quarterbacks drop at 50 yards in 3.5 seconds. That's just an anecdotal number I pulled out my ass. But for Jackson Dart, it might take th like 4.1 seconds. And that differential in time not only could make the receiver stop having to run their route deep, but it also might give more time for those defenders to get into position, which is why I have a necessarily lower view of Jackson Dart. But again, continuing on, I said he's also not as great of an athlete as the previous Ole Miss quarterbacks. Which, to be fair, that's pretty skewed because Matt Corral was a great quarterback in terms of athleticism, as well as um, who's the kid who transferred to UCF? I'm forgetting his name. He's actually on the Steelers right now. But, you know, there was a lot of really good athletes on the team. And then he also ended up missing a wide open touchdown that game. I chose South Carolina because there were a lot of quarterbacks that did play versus South Carolina. I think it's super crucial to kind of have a very similar set of Top end defensive backs, top end um, edge rushers that kind of keep the playing field even. And for Jackson Dart, definitely had some big moments. But, you know, I do think that there's a little bit lacking there in terms of the physical profile. And the offensive system is very heavily focused on being able to coddle the quarterback. And so far, we really haven't seen a really successful quarterback coming out of Lane Kiffin in a hot second. So um, just personally... I've never been really a Jackson Dart guy, but at the end of the day, he just still is going to remain as my quarterback 14. Then we go to Riley Leonard here. This is a kick in the balls because I was really hoping for him to be that guy, to be stock up. He was my QB7 coming into the year, but this is his notes versus Texas A&M. Again, very limited tape for Notre Dame in terms of all 22, but Texas A&M's performance was actually pretty indicative of the majority of the year um, because, I mean, hell, I could have chosen the next week NIU where he ended up losing, but we decided not to, but versus Texas A&M, he right off the bat, he ended up panicked, uh, panicking when he had a bad snap, um, did end up finding a check down though. So appreciate that about him. He ended up forcing a curl route, which to me is always a no, no, like simply put when you force specific stop routes, you think of a hitch, you think of a deep button hook. If you're not actually reading the corner, it's not your receiver that is the guy that you're reading. Like, oh, did he run a good curl route? No. What you need to what you need to read in those situations is like, is that defensive back being sold on a go ball? Or is he sitting and is going to absolutely eviscerate my receiver or pick off the ball? Hate when quarterbacks do that. That's just a pet peeve of mine. I've seen a lot of them in this class do it. I mean, hell, even Miller Moss's pick six can I hate to continue bringing it up, my boy, but like his pick six with Bill Will Johnson, I believe, was a stop route on the outside that, well, Will initially sold sale that he was going to sell it deep, but he ended up coming back down. So like stop routes are super crucial for high IQ quarterbacks to understand when to throw and when not to. But um, I mean, of course, this was one of the first games for Leonard, but he's also an experienced quarterback. So it is what it is. Regardless, he scrambled um, over throwing to an open target. So. You know how they say scramble to throw versus scramble to run. Uh, he tends to, like, at the least at the start of this game, he seemed to get a little bit scrambled, and then he ended up, no pun intended, I uh, ended up going for the run over the pass. He seems to handle pressure well enough to find safe targets, but his ball ends up dying on its way to the, uh, and the specific throw ended up dying on the way to a running back. He does throw with anticipation. He did a nice job on a 15-yard curl. His ball was behind over the middle. Just talked about that with Jackson Dart as well. Something I am not a huge fan of, but um, he does not seem to trust his arm more than his legs, especially when he should be trusting his arm. A deep ball died two to three yards inside of a receiver. If you are going to throw the deep ball, make sure it is on the leverage of your receiver, not the leverage of the defensive back. Because in the NFL, I can almost guarantee you they are going to look back for the ball. And if the ball is two to three yards inside, your wide receiver is being boxed out two to three yards from the ball. And you know what's in between them and the ball? The defensive back. So that's usually an interception. I digress. 
Uh, he cannot seem to throw a fade route. The ball died again, and this time it, it was a missed touchdown. So not a fan of that. Um, missed deep in route. It was low and too far in front. He missed a flat route when he should have targeted an in route. Uh, nice throw into a tight window on the outside. A bit behind on a specific out route. Nearly picked off on a forced curl. Again. Unbelievable. Uh, and then he forced an in slash slant for a near pick six. So bottom line, this is somebody who, like when I saw him at Duke, I was studying even some of his worst games, and I thought he was far superior as a processor. Um, even out the gate this year versus Texas A&M, granted it was a, it's a really solid squad, but um, they had a slow start, to be fair. Like, he did not perform well. He did not perform well. And yes, he's gotten a bit better as the season went on, but like, this game was very indicative of the type of quarterback that he could be in the NFL. I don't think that many other performances would really outshine the fact that his processing did not equate to NFL standards, but it is what it is. Um, you know, bottom line, Riley Leonard just hasn't really flourished there at Notre Dame the way I hoped for him to, but they're still getting wins. And that's kind of where your, your hope is at, is that it can continue to develop as they continue to rack up wins rather than rack up dominant performances. Carson Beck's next. So I think I had Carson Beck as my QB3 coming into the year. I was notoriously anti-Carson Beck first round. And Carson Beck's had a tough ass year. Like he's had a really rough year. And, you know, there's been those high highs, but there's also been those low lows. Speaking of versus Texas. And I also keep a lot of the standard very similar for all my quarterbacks. I like to be able to watch some of their worst games, especially if it's versus uh, translatable talent. Texas is a very good example of that. So um, honestly, I'm just going to give this a little bit of a preface for Carson Beck. Same thing with Quinn Ewers. I think PFF's kind of doing them dirty. Like we're looking at zero big time throws, multiple turnover worthy plays. And for the turnover worthy play part, yes. But I honestly think that certain quarterbacks get specific like pampered treatment when it comes to the big time throw department when guys like Carson Beck and Quinn Ewers somehow are just not. And again, I've been relatively anti Beck and anti Ewers. So like for me to start standing up for these guys and saying, man, the, the narrative is just not there. Like it's there, but I think it's being perpetuated a little too much. Regardless, this is going to be a relatively shorter one. Um, he ended up starting out the game with a solid slant uh, placement on an RPO. It was a tight coverage, so I actually really like the placement of it. He had a solid layer pass, but it ended up being behind, and it ended up being dropped. So it was a deep middle route. He ended up layering it over a linebacker underneath the safety, but it was a bit behind, so placement was not there. I say he stupidly forced a pass over the middle, but it was not bad placement if the defenders were not there. I remember this. There were two linebackers that ended up closing in on a deep in route. And bottom line, if the defenders just weren't there, it was a beautiful ball. He just didn't see the defenders. And I was like, what the hell are you doing? So uh, keep that in mind as well. He ended up having a nice throw behind the tight end in a perfect spot. So sometimes, like when you're watching, understand that throwing in stride 90 percent of the time is a good thing there are also times on specific fade routes specific go routes and specific plays where maybe a wide receiver like maybe you're a little bit late to a read where throwing to a specific side is far better to give them the best chance to catch the ball rather than throwing it in stride where it might be actually picked off or broken up so this was a perfect um, opportunity for that of course he immediately followed the play with a shitty interception that is exactly what i wrote right there um he en it ended up being an interception um there, there was also another interception right after that but it was because i think it was lawson lucky i think he ended up um or lucky lawson he ended up tipping the ball so i'm not going to give that too much shame on carson beck he ended up missing a bubble screen high so receiver was bubbling out he ripped it and then it was just way too high not a fan of that. That's also why short accuracy is not necessarily super high. He ended up missing a crosser out in front of him after he did a pump fake. I think it was Dylan Bell that he ended up just basically shanking a pass that I honestly think he normally makes. So there's just something right there with this confidence that certainly doesn't bounce back. Um, by the way, mobility is a B if it's hard to read. So I'm just re realizing that out of the corner of my eye, the back, uh, back picture is not necessarily the best placed, but... Um, he ended up having an interception after that on a horribly forced deep curl. What did I say about curl routes? I am very, very particular about 
seeing how quarterbacks read curl routes and he ended up throwing a really bad pass there and then he then he ended up adding icing to the cake and ended up awfully missing a flat route while he was on the run i remember it was um one of the tight ends he was running there was a defender right on his back like carson beck ended up throwing the ball and deflecting it off the defender's back like like think about that your tight ends in front of the guy so your tight ends here the defenders here they're running like this and you throw and you hit it off the defender's back trying to throw it to your tight end that was just straight up the icing on the cake so back really needs to bounce back i do have some like positive vibes towards carson because of the fact that i do think that it's just i don't know there's just something that he needs to mentally kick back in but man i mean it's a big fall from someone who is almost a guaranteed top 10 pick and um you know i don't know if he's even a third rounder right now yeah i'm gonna keep it that way but Let's continue on. I don't think he's Kenny Pickett Plus anymore, if I'm going to be real with you. Like, Kenny Pickett Plus is just being nice on my behalf. It might just be Kenny Pickett. And it might be even worse than Kenny Pickett at this point. I don't even know. But bottom line, uh, you know, Carson Beck just, I don't know. Should Like, can he go back for another year? I mean, like, is Georgia going to put up with him for another year if he continues to have poor performances? I don't know. But let's continue on. Noah Fafita. Yeah, you're reading that if factor correctly. This dude is 5'10", 188. I dropped his ass. Like, he is the reason why I have now a minus 7 on the it factor. Because he's a good quarterback. He really is a good quarterback. Like, I, I thoroughly think that he's, like, talent-wise as good of, like, not as good as Bryce Young. Like, I feel like that's a big stretch. But, um, like, he is what we think Bryce Young is now. Like, a guy who definitely doesn't have the size profile for the NFL, but... We kind of are just kind of rooting for him. So that is kind of the way I feel about Fafita. Uh, but again, that frame is just god awful. Let's read some notes about him versus Colorado, however. He started out the game by not feeling backside pressure. He keeps scrambling and getting deeper and deeper. I remember this was in the red zone. He just ended up continuing to back up. And that's just a really bad trait to have. You can't make a bad situation worse by continuing to drop depth. Not only that, you're also bailing the pocket when you do that. Just like... I know his mind is essentially let's get more and more deep so I can see more of the field and then have more distance to run side to side. But when your offensive linemen have to block players, you're making it easier and easier for the defenders to get away and have a clear line to you. Not a great start, but he somehow missed Tetro McMillan when he was under pressure. I do remember that he threw too high. Um, he's throwing high because he's and uh, hold on. He's throwing high because he's leaning too much. So uh, that's a, more of a mechanical issue right there. But he's basically leaning like this, leading to an arm drifting up. And then, of course, the ball doesn't actually get released properly. But he ends up bouncing back from that. Again, this is a pretty much a play-by-play. -play. He honestly has a really solid arm. Uh, his placement has been really solid since he stopped panicking. So that's honestly pretty, like, a, that's a good note to have. That's some reason why I still have a lot of faith in Fafita. His offensive line is absolute butt cheeks. Beautiful. Uh, he had a beautiful out route. He ended up missing a deep slot fade. Uh, he had nice placement on the deep go on the right side, but he had a drag open short. So that's something I did notice about him. Like when he starts getting in rhythm, he kind of gets cocky. And when you have someone like Mike Evansy, like Tetro McMillan, it can be kind of easy to do that. However, um, sometimes when you just have a beautiful short route open, don't throw the contested route. Like, just get your yards, man, and cut up field. Get, like, just do the do the path of least resistance for the most optimal gain. That deep throw was not it. Um, and then I ended up saying, my God, this line is so damn bad. He ended up having an interception on an okay decision. The wide receiver stopped coming to the ball. So um, i trying to remember if that was Travis Hunter or not who had that pick. I don't think it was. It wasn't Preston Hodge either because I know I have a Preston Hodge fan who continues to ask about Preston Hodge, but it was the other corner that they had that ended up jumping a ball when the receiver is coming back to him. I know Fafita was scrambling right, and it's like it was fine. It was a fine decision. In the NFL, the receiver continues going for that ball. Like you continue, you go through the ball to make sure that the defender doesn't blow past you and pick it off the way it was. So I wasn't really pissed off at Fafita for that. Um, he ended up being yanked and I said he'd never seen a quarterback get let down by his own team so badly as Fafita in that game. So I still have a ton of faith in the kid. Obviously he's number 11 with a minus seven. Like I think just as a passer, he is really solid. He's just 
cursed to be in a 5'10", 190 pound body. You know, uh, maybe if there's a six foot under league one day, we'll see Fafita be literally Tom Brady, but I just highly doubt it. Now let's go on to Jalen Daniels. So Jalen was my QB, uh, QB two coming into the year. And apparently he grew an inch. A lot of these quarterbacks just randomly grew an inch. Somehow Fafita lost an inch here and there. Hopefully it goes somewhere else. But Jalen Daniels was six foot coming into the year. Now he's six one. I don't think he grew. I mean, it's not like he's 17 like he was when he took his first start, but stay hydrated, everybody. Um, he's just somebody who's had a little bit of a rough year. Like, you, there's still the high heights with him, and I still have a ton of faith in him, but it's just he needs more time to develop. This is the developmental tier, right? So let's talk about his most recent game versus Kansas State. He had three big-time throws, three turnover-worthy plays. I thought it was a great opportunity to show both his high-end performance as well as his low. Um, he ends up, so starting out the game, I had noted that he likes to scramble to throw more than scrambling to run. That's because he's a solid athlete, but not really as great as you think. Um, but he ended up forcing a deep ball. It's going to be a common theme, by the way. Um, short, deep shot forced. I don't know what the hell I was writing there, but he probably ended up forcing another deep ball. He missed a throw on the row, throw on the run when he was running right. I do remember this. He ended up throwing high on a run to the when he was running to the right. He there was a dropped deep post touchdown. I ended up posting that on my Twitter, so you can feel free to check that out. But um, he ended up the wide receiver just dropped a beautiful pass for a touchdown. Uh, he had a nice scramble to the left. He ended up ripping it through pressure as well. Uh, he had a gorgeous five yard out for a touchdown. You might be like, well, a five-yard out route, it doesn't seem like something you throw a gorgeous ball on. I ended up posting that as well. It's just perfect placement in stride like we were talking about. Like, not many quarterbacks throw in stride like Jalen Daniels does. But he had a great layer pass on a deep out route that could have been thrown earlier, um, but he ended, up could have, he ended up having a better option on that play, but he ended up still making a really great pass. Uh, he, has, he did a good job on throwing the ball away for one rep. <laughs> I said, great job going through progressions and finding a wide receiver over the middle. Doesn't do that very often, but he finally started to. Uh, underwhelming is the kind of athlete as he is schemed to, but he's still a solid athlete. He gets way too cocky because after being in rhythm, the next deep throw was a horrible interception. I remember he ended up just throwing a fuck it fade route or a fuck it go route when there were two defensive backs that were deeper than the receiver. Instant no-go, overthrew the receiver, and just threw it right into the defensive back's hands. So, not a fan of that. Um, I say he's short on a roll to the right throw. So, that's the second time that I mentioned that. Running on the run to the right, ending up making a poor throw. I say he's a little bit short on a deep post, but it adjusted. Um, be, it seemed to be like, so there was another play that was exactly that touchdown was dropped. Um, and he ended up essentially under-throwing it on purpose. And that's just to give the receiver not having to catch it in stride. The receiver ended up catching it. There was enough room there. So I will say not bad on him. I said there was a turnover worthy play on an elongated play. That's a bad sign for me because when you are extending a play, hopefully you're extending it for a good reason and not a bad one. I said an unbelievable deep out route into the tiniest window on third and fourth in the two minute drill. I posted that as well as ridiculous. Uh, you put it all on the line and ended up getting lit up for a fourth down failed conversion. I said I'd end up taking a day three flyer on him, no doubt. So uh, he has all the talent in the world, and you see that on an inconsistent basis. But it really is a degradation of his processor since he hasn't, he didn't play for most of last year being injured. It sucks, but I still think Jalen Daniels is potentially going to be one of those guys where you're like, damn, I wish my team took him in the fourth round. So keep your mind open to that. Speaking of keeping your mind open, I didn't think about even regrading this player until... I was like, damn, I can't even like once I dropped Miller Moss and Kyron Drones didn't have tape. I'm like, I need something else. Like, I can't just say like, you know, it was supposed to be a top 15 video with like 15 to 16 quarterbacks. And I was like, well, now it's a 14. So that's what I'm just going to say the top quarterbacks. But I digress. Uh, Club mix comes such a long way, like such a long way. And, you know, it, it, it's funny because I have a negative bias towards him going into this study in the first play. He ended up, um, the first play I ended up watching versus Louisville, he ended, oh, excuse me, Georgia, not Louisville. Louisville tape's not out yet. Thanks. But 
um, the Georgia tape, like the first play of the year, he ends up just shanking the first throw and it's like a two yard flat route. I'm like, what in the hell? Like, why am I watching this? And that shows you like, don't give up on a player right away. Cause they have some sucky reps. Sometimes you got to give them some time. And um, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. I've watched club Nick again in regular tape, but I'm not going to grade him apart from an all 22. So let's talk about the game versus Georgia. So um, he ended up having that awful pass. That was low on a roll to the right for a flat, right? Uh, he overextended a play when there was a viable receiver open. I did see that early on in this game. He did have some issues choosing the guy that was right early on. He ended up having a beautiful deep corner route. I remember this. It was floated perfectly 25 yards downfield on the money right on the sideline too. He ended up throwing a nice crosser route. He ended up forcing a go ball. All oh, these quarterbacks force those, man. I hope, I honestly hope that it's the offensive coordinator's like, dude, just throw it, man. Just throw it. But Honestly, these quarterbacks probably just get all giddy about their receivers potentially being able to ball out. And I said he underthrew the same go route a play or two later. He ended up rerouting a tight end and put it into a great contested catch situation. I did love that about him. That's why his playmaking really boosted up from the last time. I remember he was scrambling right, and I think he ended up telling Jake Brenningstool, like, go deeper, man. Like, come on. And then he ended up putting it in a really good situation when either the linebacker or defensive back ended up turning their back to him. He was like, fuck it, I'm going to throw it at the back of their head where my tight end can go and get it. And he did. So continuing on, got to find my place again. Uh, he ended up throwing a solid NFL out route. The velocity was not incredible, however. I said, honestly, really solid placement overall. Um, he sailed an NFL out route on the right side, but then he ended up making a great NFL out route throw on the left side. So it seems like he has a little bit more comfortability on that left. Um, so and there was a deep go ball on the right side that was picked off by Malachi Starks. That was the interception. And I honestly accredit Starks more than anything for making an unbelievable catch. Um, but I did say he still forced a slot fade. So I said he made the right decision on a deep ball, scrambling right. Um, he was hit before the throw, however, so it ended up being underthrown. I did end up noting, so I'll give you the context of that play. He ended up scrambling right because the pocket broke down, and there was a receiver that was going deep that had um, separation and speed over the other players. He ended up going and targeting that route, which I thought was perfectly fine. However, he got hit. The ball was ended up going short, so it wasn't a completion. The big thing was, and I was about to say this, if he ended up not essentially getting greedy, there was a receiver that was wide open for three seconds before that. And that's what I was mentioning earlier, where I want him to see the easy and least resistance throws a little bit earlier. But let's continue. Um, he ended up having a go route that was thrown inside, leading to a pass breakup when it could have been um, a touchdown if it were placed right. I remember that the wide receiver did have separation and also room to the outside, and he ended up throwing it a little bit inside. Is going to be a little bit of a note to his overall arm velocity, but it's not like I really saw it as a necessarily bad trait of his. So uh, he learned from his mistake and hit the check down when he was scrambling the next time. There was a very similar opportunity, and then he ended up throwing to that check down. Uh, I said overall solid performance with some hiccups, but oh, since 2023, it was a massive improvement. As you guys know, Kate Klubnik was, I think, quarterback 19 for me coming into the year. And he's super young. He still could go back to school, and I honestly think that he will. But, I mean, there's a difference between someone getting benched like Moss and then Cade Klubnik, who is still having a relatively solid year. Let's continue on. Let's talk about Quinn Ewers. Some people are going to get their feathers ruffled, but I think after that Georgia game, I think more people are a little bit more understanding of the fact that Quinn is just not fully there yet. And let's talk about that Georgia game. So um, I said I wish I did not have to watch it, but, you know, simply put, I did. I said he had a nice layer on a 10-yard hitch. This was the first throw he did. It was layered perfectly over the defenders uh, in between both the safety as well as the slot defender. I said, honestly, a solid starting drive, a lot of varying rhythm. He, I said he's he had a really, um, really off-target screen ball. He underthrew a go route. His go route, his, like, his deep throws are ass. I'm just going to be real. But uh, he did not feel the back pressure, and he ended up fumbling. Uh, he missed a deep post route. He kept drip. Oh my God. That deep post route was literally rip making me rip my hair out. Pretty sure Isaiah Bond was gone for a touchdown. And then he just threw it horrifically, horrifically off target. But I digress. Um, he kept drifting back, leading to near safety. 
Uh, there was a slow throw motion leading to an interception. He did not read the boundary corner sitting as well. So there was a particular route where um, boundary receiver went on a go. Then the slot receiver went on an out. I'm forgetting what that's called. I think it's a bench route, but or it's a bench concept. But essentially what you're supposed to do is read if that boundary corner continues following your, uh, your receiver on the boundary, then you throw that out route. Otherwise, you should possibly be able to hit the honey hole on the receiver that's going on a go. Uh, Quinn ended up choosing the wrong route and he ended up throwing it to the out route, which um, if I'm not mistaken, was just a really, really, really bad play. I don't think it was an interception, but um, regard actually it did end up being an interception. So he ended up then um, going and throwing a poor check down and being, he was ended up being out based with an injury, but he ended up coming back uh, drive later. He had a nice step up and throw over the middle. He threw a beautiful touchdown layered pass. I said horribly underthrown ball uh, that was or that was bailed on by the wide receiver or he was bailed out by the wide receiver. He's forcing short throws. And I said he had a nice touchdown rip on an angle route. I posted that on my Twitter page. Jaden uh, Blue actually is a beautiful route runner. I have not given him enough credit in that regard. I said, her, OK, the continuing on, um, he had a missed touchdown throw on a particular lob. His lobs have been off for him deep on deep routes big time. He missed a read on a wide open touchdown or excuse me, a wide open tight end, but he did check it down for uh, an open running back that ended up being a drop. He forced a deep mid shot into a linebacker's hands. And then um, he ended up being actually potentially knocked by a hit. I ended up watching that pretty closely. So he was throwing into a very tight window and it ended up pretty much hitting the linebacker in the hands. And I just don't think that the defender hit his arm enough to be able to redirect the route that or throw that much, but I didn't take it into too much account because of that. So uh, he's consistently, I consistently see him not seeing the middle right part of the field. So remember when I was talking about that honey hole shot on that bench concept, again, I might be wrong about the concept off the top of my head, but you know, that honey hole shot between the safety and then the flat defender, remember how I didn't see it? Well, that middle to the middle deep right part of the field is just a consistent part of the field where I saw him not seeing receivers open. And that's one of the reasons why I thought that um, I just thought that he had a really poor performance in that regard. And, you know, it's definitely something that I was hoping for him to see a little bit better. But continuing on, I ended up giving credit for Blue being a good route runner. I said it lobbed mid right into the defensive back's hands. Once again, another, uh, I said forced another ball for an almost interception. So he kind of gets into a rhythm of making poor decisions and it looks to me like he can't handle late game pressure well, but when in rhythm is a high level passer. And I don't think people are going to disagree with that. This year has kind of exposed him in that regard. And, you know, again, there's still unbelievable untapped potential. But when the pressure's on, I don't really see Quinn being overwhelmingly uh, consistent in that regard. Then we got Dylan Gabriel here. So Dylan Gabriel was my QB1 coming into the year before I had an it factor to this degree. Um, you know, it's actually not plus one minus two. It is actually a two plus and a seven minus because even though it says he's six foot, we all know he's not. He was 5'11 coming into the year. My guy did not grow at all. But let's talk about a game versus Boise State because Boise State actually has some pretty underrated defenders. I know I could have talked about the Ohio State game, but I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's sometimes nice to use to use a different game because I honestly thought he relatively struggled versus Boise State. Regardless, um, he started out the game with a good ball velocity, ended up having good placement on a curl route. He, of course, has a beautiful rainbow ball, seems to get panicked by pressure. He has yet to throw under pressure um, and is taking a sack and scrambled every other time. I said another beautiful deep shot for a touchdown. The placement short has actually been off. He needs to learn how to check down. He ends up taking unnecessary sacks and scrambles into pressure rather than away. I keep dying for him to take a check down. When I when he identifies a blitz, he remained actually calm and ended up throwing the hot route for the touchdown. So you get to see some learning opportunity there. That's part of the it factor for him. I just wish he did this more on a regular basis. Um, or I said regular, less obvious basis because you could tell when the blitz was coming. He ended up fumbling. He had a couple deep misses. I said much less impressive overall, but it was a good foundation to see him grow upon. I mean, it's going to be very difficult for Gabriel to succeed in the NFL. Just the bottom line, you again, look at that frame and, you know, six foot is pretty damn generous. He's going to need to use a lot of hair product when he goes and measures at the combine. But 
Um, that all being aside, Dylan Gabriel is still one of the more beautiful passers in this draft. And that's why I end up talking about on sale Kyler and Russ. The Russ rainbow ball is really what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, he is elusive. He is a big playmaker. It's just, can it translate? I don't know, but he is the guy who might be leading the team to the championship. So we'll keep it in mind. We'll see if the NFL really cares that much. We'll also see if maybe it was Oklahoma that underreported his height. Maybe he is six foot. But Nuss is next. Garrett Nussmeyer, if you guys have noticed anything about the grade, a lot of these guys are tied. And I don't do that on purpose. It just ended up being that way. So keep that in mind. But Garrett Nussmeyer is next. Let's talk about his game most recently versus Texas A&M because that's where he ended up getting first round hype from. So he ended up forced overextending a play and he ended up forcing a pass right off the bat. I said the ball sometimes flies off his fingers. That's why he has a B in arm strength. B is very good. Uh, he has solid placement so far. Perfect sideline streak touchdown. That's what ended up being um, the play that got super highlighted. He ended up having a nice fade touchdown as well. He ended up forcing a deep shot, which to be fair, Garrett Nussmeyer, my biggest issue with him so far is the amount of deep passes that he forces. I don't get it. I know that he can sometimes make them, but it's like, bro, pipe down. Um, so actually my next note was love to force the deep passes. Uh, it's a nice comeback throw. He has, his deep placement has so far not been ideal, been very spotty. Of course, when it's been working, it ends up being unbelievable. I digress. Uh, he had a bad interception, so he had another receiver open that was running to the uh, running to the ball. So it's just unfortunate. Um, you know, it's not seeing the proper receivers that are open, especially when you throw an interception when you had a very easy option. Not going to be uh, the best look, so to speak. I said he had a poor deep right shot. Up oh, there, you go. There's another one to an open wide receiver. He missed a tight end with space as well. Uh, hospital pass because it was high, forced a f interception on a five-yard curl. I rest my case. You guys know how I feel about those. And then he almost did it again. Then, like, I think the next player or a couple plays after. He ended up floating a deep shot with a single high safety coming across, which um, not a fan of that. You do not float a deep pass when there is a rangy safety over the middle. You thread and you zip that motherfucker, man. You do not let that hang in the air when you have a ball hawking single high safety. Um, I don't think it ended up being an interception, but it certainly will be in the NFL. As he needs to learn how to slide, another interception if it were versus NFL defensive backs. He ended up rolling into a sack twice, and then it just ended up being a game where I'm very worried about his NFL projection, which is why he's still a developmental player. I do want to emphasize the fact that um, all the way up to Cade Klubnik, all these guys are the same grade. Um, Garrett Nussmeyer just has those throws that are just unbelievable. So for a team that wants to develop him, I think that it's perfectly fine. I do worry at six foot two, 200 pounds that he is not necessarily the high end athlete that you're actually looking for. Like, it's not like he could lose some pounds and gain some athleticism. He sure as hell can't. But I am a little bit worried about Nuss because people really do love him as that like legit first round quarterback. And the high level plays are there, but the consistency is not. And the NFL quarterback position has nothing to do with high end plays. We think it is, but it really is about consistency. Like don't lose your team the game. And yeah, over time, and especially because defenses make mistakes, you're going to have opportunities to make those big throws. So it's good that you have that opportunity but you need to be consistent. And that's why I'm a bit worried about Nuss. So technically he could have been QB9, but I ended up being a little bit nice. Then you got Jalen Milrow at five. Once again, the grade has not changed. So again, I just want to keep that in context. But regardless, I think Jalen Milrow has a ton of potential. It's just, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Let's talk about it. So this is versus Tennessee. Um, it was not a good game for him. But again, this grade is not solely based off Tennessee. This grade is based on the entire year, but this is just the game I want to read to you. He had a good extension to play, but ended up missing a comeback route on his scramble. He missed a flat to the left. He had a really bad miss behind on a roll right to the deep portion of the right field. I actually ended up posting that one as well. Um, there have been a thousand penalties on the specific drive I was talking about. There was a bad miss on an open stop route deeper, deeper left of the field. 
I posted that as well. Essentially, the receiver was 15, 20, maybe 25 yards downfield. It was a stop route. The dude was completely open. And Milrow was extending the play, saw him, was not under pressure, and just zipped the ball over his head. Like, there was no contested catch, nothing. Just missed a wide-open receiver. Mm, let, let's let's continue on. Um, <laughs> mm, you can see, I, I boosted Milrow to be not QB10, by the way. I ended up doing that to myself. Let's let's continue on, though. Let's continue on. Um, ended up having... Uh, so he had an awful throw mid on the run after a nice evasion. So at least he has that escape ability, but he ends up missing a throw on the run, which then he ends up throwing an interception. And so his accuracy short right has been solid, though, so kind of antithetical to Miller Moss. I know Miller keeps getting freaking fades, and you guys know I love the guy, but... Miller Moss has just some of the issues that other quarterbacks have as their strengths. So it just, you know, it sometimes his name has to come up. Uh, he ended up overshooting a fade by an extremely large margin. So shanked a deep throw. Oh, he ended up overthrowing a wide open player again. Uh, the decisions have been fine. The throws have just been horrible. Another overthrow. Please stop it, Jalen. I have that in all caps. I do. I swear to God, it's right there. Um, he did not end up feeling backside pressure. His red zone IQ drops when it comes to forcing reads. Uh, nice delivery on a crosser over the middle, finally. I'm genuinely embarrassed for him. The placement this game has been the worst I've seen from a quarterback considered in the first two rounds. Uh, interception to end the game is icing on top. This displayed how far he has to grow to be remotely an NFL quarterback. Oh, man, that, that breaks my heart, man. If I'm just going to be real, that breaks my heart. But, you know, Milrow has shown the potential. I do think that that performance versus Georgia was very, very overblown. Um, you know, without Ryan Williams pretty much making two of the most incredible catches of the year, we would not be talking about Jalen Milrow the way that we are right now. But next, we got Will Howard. Will was one of the reasons why I ended up loving Ohio State this year and thought they easily could win the championship. And I still think that he can be one of the main reasons for it. If he just slid a quarter of a second, a half a second earlier. And to my, in my opinion, I still saw time on the clock when he ended up calling timeout and slid. But regardless, um, I think they would be undefeated. They would be Oregon. So I think that was a simple mistake. It was a silly mistake. But let's talk about how he performed versus Penn State. Obviously, great frame, 6'4", 235. Um, he ended up starting out the game with a pick six. I'm like, all right, <laughs> okay. Um, but he ended up having that next drive being a lot of pinpoint passes, including a great bounce back with a clean rollout touchdown. So he rolled out left. A, I think a tight end slipped up right, and it was just a beautiful throw, probably 50 yards if you're looking at the Pythagorean theorem right there. But um, it was just a great throw and a great way to bounce back right after you threw a pick. So, And on that drive, he ended up having a slant that he ended up throwing as well. That pick six that he started out with, very similar play, which I could tell he slightly hesitated and he a little bit, he threw it a little bit over the top. But honestly, the fact is he bounced back. I'm a big fan of that. So he ended up having a nice extension and it ended up being dropped by the receiver, ended up being a little bit high as well. He had a go ball that ended up being a couple of yards short, which again, you guys know me, I'm not a fan of that. I said he did a great job dishing the ball off when he was being sacked. So he was actually going up and going to scramble and the defender got around his legs. He ended up making almost a Will Levis level um, little shovel pass but it ended up not being the Will, Le Will Levis result, ending up being in a good first down, I believe. Uh, he might have been sacked on that play. I'm trying to remember if, but the actual play itself was excellent. I don't know if he got it off in time. Um, I ended up talking about how Donovan Jackson was letting him bet down big time. His play at left tackle was fucking atrocious. Uh, then I said Jeremiah Smith let him down by stopping uh, his route. So there was a particular route where, or a particular play where, um, Will Howard ended up seeing that Jeremiah Smith had some separation. And I think Jeremiah Smith ended up seeing that the safety was taking a weird angle and he just slowed down, probably thinking that he wasn't the target. And he ended up being the target. The ball was already in the air and then he had to speed back up and then drop the ball. Um, very, very, very sad because I think that the story about Will Howard would be completely different if he ended up hitting that strike on that play and ended up having a massive touchdown difference because 
the statistical performance of Will Howard was not great. But it, you also forget about the fact that he almost just had you know a 50-yard touchdown play right there that was dropped, not due to his throw, but due to uh, Jeremiah Smith not believing that he was even targeted. So I said, not going to lie, since the first force throw, he has been extremely spot on. He ended up having a great deep out route as well. He does a solid job with his legs and then won the game with a quarterback keeper. Versus Penn State, versus without a left tackle. A left tackle, as a matter of fact, and I love Donovan Jackson, you guys know this. A left tackle that had a zero pass blocking grade, he ended up beating one of the best teams in the country. Shout out to Will Howard, man. Um, you know, very underrated. No one talks about him as a day two pick, but... I think he very much deserves it. Now let's talk about the guy who was on the other side of the field, Drew Aller. And you guys know I love Drew. Um, didn't love him coming into the year. He's QB 17 for me. But I have been very, very, very positive on my Drew Aller love. And you guys will see that my quarterback rankings have shifted because if you guys did not see the start of the video, I have actually ended up modifying how I grade my quarterbacks. And I think that it's a good modification because I gave too many gimme points for things like um, mechanics. For things like playmaking as well that were very subjective. So by doing this, I've allowed for a little bit more control that um, that basically gives a little bit more credence to more quarterback e type of um, more quarterback e traits. So I think that's going to be something that is a big positive. Ended up almost killing Jalen Milrow's stock, but you know I ended up saving him from that. But continuing on, let's talk about actually Aller versus Ohio State. Hello, because people like to shit on Aller for having a subpar performance. Well, let's talk about it, right? Um, so he ended up using his legs to get the yards that he that have been like given to him on that first drive. He was very, very, very pro scrambling, which for his size, I mean, and for his athletic capability, not necessarily the thing I overly love, but at the same time, it's better than staying in the pocket too long and, you know, getting hit. So it keeps the drive going. He ended up having solid check down decisions. He forced a touchdown ball, but it was thrown or th forced a ball that was for a touchdown. Um, but it was thrown right high and away from the defenders. It was too high. So it was in the red zone. Ended up zipping it, but it was way too high. And I do like that. So um, the reason why I enjoy seeing quarterbacks, even if they force a read in the red zone, throwing that particular ball is because you only really give your receiver the opportunity to catch it. Like it's a poor decision executed perfectly, if you get what I'm saying. So at least it doesn't end up becoming a turnover worthy play. Uh, would like to see him throw a bit more after he scrambles. So similar to what I was talking about with Jackson Dart, like don't just scramble to scramble, man, scramble to throw. And Drew Aller is far from the guy who is built like Lamar Jackson. So uh, and he has a beautiful arm. So I think he should be able to do that. So continuing on. He had a nice lob with a uh, he had a nice precise lob, ended up being a failed contested catch. However, so I thought that he placed it perfectly. The receiver let him down. He ended up having a nice thread over the middle, but it was a little bit low and still was catchable. However, uh, it just depends. Drew Aller's placement has gotten far better over time, but still, uh, something I did know is that Penn State has shitty play designs. There were a lot of like route concepts that just did not yield open receivers. And it ends up looking bad on Drew because he's not throwing routes, right? Or when he throws, it's tight coverage, etc. cetera. Um, so he realized the correct read a little bit late, leading to a pass breakup. So there's some timing issue right there. These receivers are not doing shit to help him out. Great deep float. Uh, would have liked it a little bit more outside on a go ball. Ended up being a drop touchdown that somebody had. Uh, he said, nice step up over the middle, and then he ended up ripping it. I think I ended up posting that one as well. Um, he did not see a honey hole thread opportunity leading to a sack. I said, a little inside still on a specific fade, but it ended up being a good contested catch throw. I said, he thread the needle, but ended up leading to a drop touchdown ending the game. So I ended up posting that as well. It literally was in the hands of the receivers like not many quarterbacks could make a better throw i just think drew alar probably will return to school he's 20 years old man he has unbelievable potential sky's the limit for this kid but you know his team's not doing him any favors tyler warren's gonna leave and without tyler warren i don't think drew alar is gonna look too much better but um you guys know me i'm a i'm a sucker for drew alar to the steelers kind of hoping that that happens cam ward is next so yeah oh god i can't wait for the comments for the people that come after me for this one but um, you guys know who my number one quarterback is right now based on my new criteria, but 
Um, it's talking about Cam Ward versus Florida State, one of the most recent performances, I believe the most recent. So he ended up missing a chance to end up ripping it deep, which is, um, you know, that's kind of weird for Cam Ward. He likes to do that. I said, these play designs are not great. There's a lot of time needed for uh, development of routes and a little and very little to check down to in case the play, play breaks down. Honestly, it, it's kind of sad. I don't know why these offensive coordinators in college don't know how to do proper route concepts, but you know, it's, there's a reason why certain offenses just continue to dominate year after year and certain offenses don't. Maybe it's time to look at the play callers, but let's get back to it. Um, he ended up overshooting a few deep balls, which I prefer to under throws when your guy is deepest. Remember, I ended up talking about how Jalen Daniels overshot his receiver, but the, do, the two defensive backs were deeper than the receiver. Um, Cam Ward had a receiver deep, deeper than the defensive back, and he overthrew him. I prefer overthrows in that instance. Let's continue on though. Nice extension with the scramble for in a throw for a first down. These receivers are doing him also zero favors in this game. A little high on a specific deep mid route throw, but it was perfectly catchable. He's throwing a bit high consistently. He ended up forcing a crossing route, but he does well in tempo. Uh, he ended up overshooting another deep fade. I said, great job pulling the throw when a defender jumped into a passing lane and he still adjusted to deliver the throw on time. I remember, I think it was an RPO and he went out like this to throw the ball. Defender went right into the lane. He pulled it down and then threw it again and adjusted and put it right on the money. So I really loved seeing that. That is, even though some of the other plays this game didn't show that processing, that quick twitch processing is not something you can inherently control. That is something deep within you. And I love the fact that he has that at least in that instance. Uh, regardless, jumping back to it, he has a good awareness on when to bail the pocket. Uh, good placement outside when he had a tight end or when his tight end had separation. He had a good play extension. Then he ended up having a Philly special receiving touchdown. Um, bottom line, Cam Warden continuing to improve overall. Um, I think that he's obviously taken a massive step this year. But when it comes down to it, I want him to throw with a little bit more anticipation that works on that timing right there. And that easily could vault him up to that QB one territory. Cause if you see how close Jadur Sanders is, it makes a lot of sense how damn close these guys are. But let's talk about Shadur Sanders here. You guys know that I've had my qualms with Shadur Sanders in terms of the potential ego that comes with the Sanders name. And that's not solely Shadur's fault. I mean, we know Dion has a massive ego. It is what it is. Has he earned it? Sure. I don't think Shadur has properly earned the prime ego because prime is arguably one of the best players slash athletes we've ever seen. But in this class, he is the best quarterback. And do I think Shadur Sanders is overrated? Yes. But I also think every other quarterback in this class, for the most part, is heavily overrated. We talk about these guys as top five picks and they aren't like you put Shadur Sanders next to Jaden Daniels. You can't say that you're going to take Shadur Sanders. I don't know why you would. Put him next to Caleb Williams. Put him next to Drake May. You really start having the conversation when it's like, okay, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix, Bo Nix. And like when you're starting to have that conversation, then you got to realize that last year's quarterback class was unbelievably top-heavy. There was like nobody except Spencer Rattler that was really considerable after that initial group of guys. You can talk about Joe Milton as well, but people thought it was a position change. Like, that was why the NFL really heavily focused on that. And there were a lot of teams that needed quarterbacks. So it's not a dig at Shadur. It's a dig at the whole entire evaluation of the quarterback position. Because the quarterback position is either the biggest boom or bust position you can draft. If they start, awesome. If they start well, perfect. But if they don't, or if they're just not able to start, you completely shanked a first round pick because they're not offering value on special teams. They're not offering value in another position. Not many. Logan Thomas ended up doing that. But just keep that in mind. If you want to look at why certain players might be viewed as overrated, maybe it's more so the position group itself. This applies far more than, than to Shadur. It's to everybody. Like I personally wouldn't draft a quarterback in the first round this year, unless I have an offensive coordinator that I truly believe in to put this specific type of quarterback into the best situation. He has a track record for it, and he ends up also having a very, very good plan for it. But I think Shadur Sanders has the highest floor out of anyone in the class because he has the best processor. I've maintained that claim this whole time, and I'm going to continue 
doing so. So, um, started out versus Kansas State, one of the most recent games, I think the most recent game. He had a nice rhythm throw on a five-yard out route. He had a nice wheel throw as well. Forced a throw to uh, Travis Hunter deep, but it wasn't a bad ball. Uh, he ended up having a nice delivery on a zig route. A uh, nice calm delivery as well under pressure. I mean, his offensive line has actually been better than expected this year, but he still has a lot of experience under pressure. He has good pocket movement for the most part. Ends up being extremely inconsistent in that regard. But again, this is just like a play-by-play -play review. Um, he had nice placement on a drag route. He has a good feel for hit behind him in pressure and then ended up maneuvering for a 15-yard throw downfield. Did end up continuing. He, he ended up slipping up a couple times, but... Let's continue on. Um, he's still a limited athlete. He dropped, he ends up dropping way too deep. I ended up posting about this as well. He has like an 11 yard drop where remember when I was talking about um, with Fafita about the idea that the deeper you drop, the harder it is for your offensive line. Same thing, same thing. There's a reason why, but continuing on, um, it's it's something that did, did bother me. And I know a couple other people brought it up too. He ended up having a good spot on a soft, or he ended up throwing to a good spot into a soft spot in zone coverage. Uh, he has to watch out for holding on to the ball in one hand when he's being sacked, because that's going to lead to fumbles. His decision-making has been pretty much spot on. He ended up rolling into a sack. He ended up sailing a ball for an interception. I said he really needs to not drop so deep. It makes it impossible for the offensive line to block, pop, block properly. And I said, overall, he does have some big negatives, but this was a great showing versus much closer to NFL talent. Uh, once again, Shadur Sanders, as a passer, is really solid. There's a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL who have succeeded without an elite arm. So it's not impossible for him to succeed without an elite arm. The thing is between here is actually a really good processor and that is going to create a very good floor. Even if let's just say he fails and is going to be a backup quarterback. That is the type of backup quarterback you want because if he comes in for three, four games, he is going to have a great processor to not lose you games. And I love that about Shadur. And that's why he should be a QB one in a lot of people's minds, because even if he fails, I just told this about, I just said this, like quarterback's the worst position to draft. If you cannot guarantee that they'll start or at least have a high percentage chance. Shadur's that one guy where if he ends up failing being a backup quarterback, he might be the best backup out of any of these guys without the developmental portion. So keep that in mind. Um, that's going to be the video though. I love you guys. Thank you so much for watching and enjoying the show. I'll see you on the far side. Peace.